our next speaker is Diogo Monica, which is very easy name for me to pronounce for once because he's Portuguese, I'm Brazilian, we have that language thing in common. And this talk is about scaling your security organization. Thanks, Diogo. It's the second time he's a speaker at the Scale conference. It's nice to have you back. Well, I know if I don't get invited next year, I uh, screwed up this hardcore, right? <laughs> So today's talk, uh, again, my name is Yoga Monica. I work at Square. Uh, thank you, Facebook, for inviting me again, second year in a row. Um, I'm going to talk about the human botnet and how to scale your secure organization. So today's talk is really about this graph over here. So in the y-axis, you have the number of hours that a security engineer sleeps. And on the x-axis, you actually have the number of employees that organization has. Our realization was that in the beginning, while you're getting all of your ducks in a row, obviously you don't get a lot of sleep. But things get better, and you start actually sleeping nine hours per night. Unfortunately, there is an inflection point. Around 200 people, more or less, the number of hours that you sleep per night actually starts going down. And the reason for that is that there are so many people coming to the organization, and obviously the security engineers are just freaking out, right? So today's talk really is about this delta. It's about how at Square, we've actually been able to go back to sleeping nine hours per night and some insights of how you can do that too. Particularly in terms of agenda, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about vulnerability management, how to scale vulnerability management, gonna be talking about how to scale access control and how to scale security monitoring. Perfect. So on to the first one, vulnerability management, something that we're all very familiar with. So in an ideal world, obviously vulnerabilities would be found would be fixed with an SLA magically without the involvement of your security team. In reality, the world unfortunately does not work like that, right? That's why we have jobs. However, at Square, one of the things that we realized was that what we really wanted to do was to really minimize our involvement with both finding and fixing these vulnerabilities. We wanted to do this, however, in a way that actually allowed us to still manage our risk effectively, particularly wanted to make sure that we were fixing and we were maintaining our SLAs as much as possible. So <laughs> this is a diagram of something that you're probably familiar with. It's called the vulnerability lifecycle. This is the first time ever that I do a presentation that has a diagram of vulnerability lifecycle, which is very managerial of me. However, however, um, <laughs> hang on tight. So the reality is that there is this vulnerability lifecycle management and there are several steps that you do. Uh, you discover vulnerabilities, you classify and prioritize these vulnerabilities, you also report, have a risk profile for them, and then you do remediation and verification. And our realization was, with, was that as the number of vulnerabilities increases, we obviously did not want to increase the number of people on the team that had to deal with them, right? So we're gonna go over each of these um, parts of the vulnerability lifecycle and try to see how we try to remove ourselves from them. The first one really is discovery. By the way, that animation was really cool. I'm gonna do that again, because that was this 45 minutes of my life right there. Um, in terms of discovery, um, we, Essentially at Square, we do not have an internal team, an internal red team. We don't really believe in having breakers internally or at least a team that does that full time. What we have though is four different ways of getting bugs uh, to be reported to us. The first one was talked very extensively on the previous talk by Katie, uh, the bug bounty. Uh, we have a bug bounty, good vulnerabilities come from the bug bounty. There's a little bit of uh, issue with SNR, but we sometimes hire external people to deal and make sure that um, the impact or the quality of the vulnerabilities is actually high. The second one is obviously each quarter we have external pen testers that come in and bang on our stuff and they're really good at finding vulnerabilities, obviously. We also have internal reports. Obviously, they're an engineering organization. Usually, your ops people find bugs, find problems and report them, create jury tickets, et cetera. And then we also have your internal and external scanners. So on this one, the final one, on internal and external scanners, I, I would like to make two points. The first one is that one of the easy things that we did and that obviously you can do is all three of the first ones are very easy to see how tickets or how vulnerabilities go from being found to a ticket in Jira being filed, right? However, for vulnerability managers, we did the same thing. So we automated everything in a way that every time a vulnerability is found, magically a Jira ticket appears and we can track it. And what we did from there was something called pop quiz. So pop quiz really is a meta scanner. So it's an aggregator of all the scanners. And our objective here was that we wanted to make the staging environment, so before it goes out to production, the staging environment should be more adversarial than the internet. So what happens is that every time an application gets deployed to staging, PopQuiz 
gets together all the SQL injection testers, cross-site scripting testers, all the vulnerability testers, and just bangs on all of those endpoints as much as it can. So all the developers are actually very used to, or should be very used to, every time they deploy the staging, they're going to get the errors, you're going to get the alerts. And obviously this is integrated into the JIRA queue, into the JIRA ticketing, and it actually uh, works exactly the same way as everything else. Um, this is an example of, for example, us doing a very simple after Poodle SSLv3 check just to make sure there were no endpoints that were accepting SSLv3 internally, and that now stays on to the future. If there's ever regression, obviously, we get alerted. So PopQuiz really allowed us to essentially scale that component of it and have all the tickets being generated by all the different applications and vulnerability managers that we have internal. For the sec one, second one, what we realize is that vulnerability, vulnerability type is actually pretty obvious. Whether it comes from a bug bounty report or comes from an automated scanner, the kind of the class of vulnerability is actually pretty obvious. So the way that we wanted to do classification and the way that we did it was we simply created a table that takes in vulnerability type and takes in our security zones. We have a set of internal security zones with different priorities and different importances and essentially spews out a priority. This is the priority that you should be putting on your ticket on this vulnerability. So obviously, if this is a table, it means that all the machines and all the automated systems can also file all the tickets with this priority already. So you don't even have to go through the tickets and prioritize them yourselves. It's, this is actually a very good first guess for what priority those bugs have. So as an easy example, you have a table here for cross-site scripting where there are several priorities depending on the zone and where in the infrastructure they are. It's just an example of something like this or something would look like. In terms of prioritization, now that we know what is the priority of each ticket, we can actually very simply just assign it an SLA. Something as simple as P0s get fixed within 24 hours, or P1s get fixed within seven days, and P2s 30 days. So this mapping is very easy, and is obvious, uh, it's actually very obvious for developers and for people to understand in how much time they actually have. They don't understand the priorities because they're not security engineers, but they understand, oh, this actually has to be fixed in seven days, good. So the cool thing here, though, is that we wanted to remove ourselves from actually fixing these tickets, and we wanted to remove ourselves from actually managing this. So what we did was we assigned these tickets to the managers of the teams that actually have the projects, to which projects the vulnerabilities belong to, right? So the managers are actually the ones that are responsible to ensure that all the vulnerabilities are fixed, and they're actually within SLA. The security team itself acts essentially as consultants. The only thing we do is we help them address the class of vulnerability, and we help them address to make sure that they're not just fixing this specific instance of a problem, they're actually doing a better solution overall. But it's on their side to actually make sure that this is fixed and actually make sure the SLAs are kept. The way that we keep track of this, though, is we have a weekly meeting. In the weekly meeting, we go over all the vulnerabilities that are outside of the SLA. And the managers have mandatory attendance. They have to be there if they have a vulnerability outside of the SLA. A pro move, though, is bring in the VP of engineering. The VP of engineering should be on that weekly meeting and should make the effort to be there. And the reason for that is this. So if I have a graph of the number of days <laughs> that it takes to fix a P2 vulnerability, obviously if there's no VP, everything gets done in the last minute. If you have the VP in the room, magically everything gets done a lot faster. I'll leave up to you to decide as to why that happens. <laughs> <laughs> this will be online, so you can always take a screenshot later. In terms of reporting, I also mentioned that everything goes into JIRA, right? So everything is, goes into JIRA, all the tickets, whether they're human created, machine created, the priorities are all there, everything goes into JIRA. What this allows us to do is now we have an API. JIRA has an API, so we can actually build something cool on top of that and augment it with more information. And this is where report card comes in. Report card was something that we built at Square. It's essentially the way that we socialize the security status of a specific project. So for each project, we have, um, graph of the number of the priority, the average priority of vulnerability, number of vulnerabilities, the churn in the code, code climate, number of force pushes to master, um, what is the rate of approval of pull requests. All of this information gets digest uh, or gets compressed and actually shown on something like this that is public for everybody to see. And obviously there are rankings, so you can see a little bit of a gamification of security there. Uh, but the objective here is really to have a good insight into what teams we should be working closer with, what projects we should be closing, working closer with. So instead of just not knowing which, pro uh, which products or which partic particular projects we should be testing, we now know which teams we have to be working and um, involved more closely with. So this is really cool. 
And the second thing is you have a bug bounty. So make sure that the prizes of the bug bounty come out of the budget of the teams whose bugs were. And this is actually a good way of incentivizing and ensuring that all the, um, all the incentives are aligned, right? In terms of remediation, as I mentioned before, we really act as consultants at Square, and we ensure that the classes of problems are solved, not just a specific individual bug. Finally, in terms of verification, we did a few cool things there. Scanners, uh, as soon as they see that a vulnerability was fixed, they close the tickets automatically. This is very useful because there were tons and tons of situations where by doing an operating system update, for example, several vulnerabilities were addressed simultaneously, and instead of people actually going and fixing these things, scanners are the ones responsible to actually understanding that, no, this actually got closed, and it gets closed automatically. The other thing that we did was obviously alerts around SLAs. If something gets out of SLA, we get alerted, but better than that, things actually get put directly into agenda of the next weekly meeting with the, uh, the vice president of engineering to make sure that we know as to why they are out of SLA. Sometimes there are good reasons, but the majority of times it's just a very good push in the right direction. Perfect, so this was vulnerability management. On to the second topic, which is access control. So access control is one of those things that we also have a lot of issues with and all companies struggle with, right? So by default, secure organizations end up being the gatekeepers of access control. You come into an organization and there are several types of access. There are several authentication mechanisms that get spread out. There are several authorization systems that get spread out. And you are responsible to ensuring that everybody has access to them and that they actually sync. So this is something that is just the reality of it. What we wanted to do, though, was, again, we wanted to minimize our involvement with both adding and removing access to all the systems and applications inside of our organization. And the second thing we wanted to do was making sure there is sanity in these accesses and that we could audit this access so there is a, a good way of making sure that the, le the principle of least privilege was actually being followed, right? So obviously, we still want to do this. We want to minimize our involvement while still managing our, our risk effectively. So before we, I show you how we did this and how we were able to scale this component, there were, there were two things that we needed to do first. The first one is obviously we had to have centralized access. So at Square, we have OpenLDAP, and OpenLDAP is essentially the de facto um, data store for authorization and um, for authentication. Uh, on, top of the, on top of OpenLDAP, though, we built um, a shim, we built an application that we called UserDB. And UserDB essentially did two things for us. First, we don't have to integrate with OpenLDAP on all of our applications, which is a great win, so we have a RESTful API. And the second important thing was that we had a testable way of uh, ensuring that access gets removed and ensuring that access gets added. So many times what happens is that you think a user got their access removed or there is some other component of access somewhere else, and since it's not centralized and since you don't have a testable way of actually guaranteeing that the access went away, you need something like this. So you need testability. You need to ensure that things don't actually break. And we also obviously, since this was an API, we built a simple JavaScript point and click interface that looks something like this. So it says UserDB, lists all of your users. It also allows you to drill down an individual user and see their uh, public SSH key. This gets uh, spread out uh, from here to all the systems. You can see all the groups that a person belongs to and you have a one button that you can click and all the access in your organization for that individual goes away. So that centralization is really good. So this was number one. We solved centralized authorization and authentication data store. However, we have tons of applications. Applications in organization just explode, right? Everybody wants their own visualization data store or their own metric store and their own dashboard to visualize X and Y. So what we needed now was actually a way to aggregate all of these applications and ensure they were actually using our centralized authorization authentication data store, right? So when the user gets removed or when access gets removed, that application immediately knows. So what we ended up doing was we built our own internal SSO as we built our own internal everything. So our own homegrown SSO, though, had several few reasons why uh, we needed to do it ourselves and couldn't just really take something off the shelf. Number one was that we wanted to be um, very we wanted to have two-factor authentication from day one, and we wanted the ability of actually moving um, towards different uh, forms of two-factor authentication in the future as fast as possible. So today we use YubiKeys and use um, HOTP, uh, or TOTP, I'm sorry, um, Google Authenticator. However, if we want to move to something that the FIDO Alliance uh, brings out, we can move very quickly to it. The other thing is that inside of our organization, we use mutual TLS for essentially everything. So we wanted our SSO to not only authenticate the backend 
with the certificates, make sure that there was the right backend that, they were, that we were talking to. We wanted also the backends to authenticate the SSO. And so every request that comes in, the backend knows, no, this is signed. Only the cert certificate from this SSO actually um, is allowed to communicate with me. And the authorization and the user that is being forwarded is actually uh, trust trustworthy, right? It's something that we can trust. Additionally, we also wanted to do cool stuff like um, capture browser analytics. If you have a browser that is out of date, you cannot log it into production, for example. And it was also the perfect place for us to do honeypots, right? If you're an attacker, you want to go over uh, one of these applications that does administration of X, you have to go through this. And there's all sorts of funny honeypots in there for you to find and for us to be alerted on. Perfect. So this is what the login page looks like, a simple two-factor authentication um, page. So now I've been talking about how we were able to centralize our management and enforcement of authorization and authentication with user to be dormant. But the problem that I was referring to initially was really how do we have a scalable way of ensuring user access and ensuring that users can request access and access gets removed after a while. So now that we have these two components, we did something actually pretty cool. So Dorman works as an app store. A user logs into Dorman and has access to a portal. And immediately what, they, what they can do is they can request access to sev several different applications. So now they can request access, and instead of the access request coming to us, coming to security, the access request actually goes to the managers. The managers of that individual person, of that individual team, are actually the best people to decide if they actually need access to this data or not, right? So they're the best people to make sure that access is only being given to the people that actually need it. And also, as bonus points, we never get to see any of this. I don't have to, act to actually approve anyone. It all happens under the hood without InfoSec actually caring. So now the, the problem is you have managers giving out access, right? So how do we know that it's not being abused? And how do we know that this actually gets to a place where, it's, um, where access has the principle of least privilege? And this is where access aspiration comes in. Access aspir expiration. Wow, that word is hard. Um, expiration, we built it to work for essentially arbitrary capabilities. So anything from access to a dashboard, SSH into a zone, or a specific capability inside of a specific app, everything has exp expiration built in. So in activity, essentially, if you don't use that capability for a while, if you don't access SSH to production, if you don't use this capability, if you don't, don't access this admin dashboard, it will eventually go away. And this is how we can see that in a situation where there's no expiration, a user or an employee joins the company on day zero, and then on day X, it is a strictly monotonically increasing function in terms of access. It always grows. Day X is always, always, always larger in terms of uh, access than day X minus one. So what we built is by having expiration, we can see that a similar thing is not true anymore. So on day X, the user actually only has access to the things that are used in the past X amount of days. And that is great. It actually actually tends, as time goes on, to least privilege. And it also means that if an attacker compromises that specific user, it is only going to have the access privilege as the user has in that particular moment. It doesn't matter if the user had root access six months ago, it no longer has root access to it. So this is actually how we were able to solve that. And that obviously makes us sleep a lot better at night because we know that automatically things are just going down in terms of access. And if somebody, the, the other thing is that since adding access and since requesting access is so easy and distributed, there's no load on a, on a person. If you leave for vacation for a month and a half and then all of your access goes away, it's actually very easy for you to just click and request access to all the applications that you need again and for your manager to approve it. So it's not load on the security team and it's not a lot of significant added load on the managers because each team has its own manager. Finally, let's talk a little bit about security monitoring and what we did around security monitoring at Square. So again, our goals really were, we wanted to, we realized that low SNR alerts are always gonna happen, right? There are always gonna be alerts that we want to, want to care about. However, there's gonna be a lot of them. And as the organization grows, as the number of engineers grow, those number of alerts also grow, but the security team shouldn't really grow with it. So we wanted a way of minimizing our involvement with filtering these low SNR alerts. And we also wanted a way that was more efficient of actually communicating to engineers about new policies or why a particular behavior is risky or why a particular behavior should not be, um, should not be allowed to continue moving forward, for example. And we wanted to do this 
again, mitiga mitigating our risk of um, not detecting malicious behavior. So we wanna make sure that the security organization uh, improves after doing this. So what we build was, again, build your own. We build our own internal um, alerting engine called Sting. Sting is essentially um, an application that does alerting that is backed by the police, Sting and the police. And is essentially, the police is a Hadoop-based um, pipeline that has uh, Hive on top of it. Sting is a little bit smart. It knows who's on call. It, it talks to UserDB, so it knows what a, a, a user account is, what a machine account is. And it, it knows a lot more about the organization. It has the concept of zones of uh, security. It has a lot of information about the organization that other applications simply don't. So it allows us to do, actually do very smart decisions here. And it's a thing that is essentially responsible for receiving the suspicions and then deciding where do the suspicions, suspicions go. Do I alert someone or do I not alert someone? Our realization with the previous version of Sting, so we had an alerting mechanism called Panopticon, which was the thing that aggregates essentially all the logs, aggregates all the logs, and then fed to the security team, look, these are the things that you should be looking at. But again, it was only the security team that was looking at these, um, these logs specifically in the previous system. So on the new system, what we decided to try is, okay, so Sting is still gonna be aggregating all the logs, and we know that some of these alerts are gonna be low SNR. But instead of sending everything to the security team, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna send it to the engineers that actually triggered these alerts. So they are gonna be the ones responsible for telling us, did you do this or did you not do this? And if you didn't do this, please escalate. So we built this concept of a self-serviceable -ser alert. And we tried to make sure that as many alerts as possible are self-serviceable. And so the way it works is an alert comes in, we verify if it's self-serviceable or not. If it's not, it comes directly to us. Those number of alerts should be very, very small. If it's self-serviceable, the user gets the alert, and then one of two things happen. Either the user says, yes, this was me, and is able to see why we think this behavior is risky, so next time he doesn't do it, or it sees some instructions of, this is how you can avoid this behavior in the future, and then they say, yeah, this was me, and everything goes away, and we never get an alert. Or there's a timeout. So if the user doesn't really say this was me in a certain period of hours, we actually get the alert and then we go investigate. And since we actually get paid for these things, there's this social, there, there's a social contract that is actually not cool to ping the InfoSec team because your life will probably be a lot worse in the future if you continue doing so. So essentially what happens is that people actually like this and make sure that go into this portal and actually um, say that, yes, this was me. The other thing that we do is if there is a number of unalerted, uh, unacknowledged alerts, so if there's um, a spur of five different alerts in a row that actually are unacknowledged for the user, then we immediately also want to be notified. So this is how we were able to actually cut down a significant amount. I would say that we get 90% less of the alerts just because of this. And the ones that we do get are very, very ISNR. What Sting looks like is this. What we focused on, and this was, was actually a great idea, we realized that developers, when they received the alerts, there was a lot of cognitive load to actually understand what the alert was telling them. It was hard for them to understand that what behavior actually led to this alert. It was hard for them to understand this. So what we did was we built a system that essentially shows you what was the common line command that you ran and in which system were you and what exactly happened at what time. And so very quickly they can understand, oh yeah, I did run this, this was me. Oh cool, and this was also me because I was on this machine do doing this role plan. And so they just approve those things. And it's very easy for them to click and also the interface is very appealing. So people actually think that this is kind of cool because they are going out on their own and actually have received emails with people that are sad that they don't have any alerts for those days. So why wasn't this alerted? Because I want to click on it. So it's actually kind of cool that you go from something that it's actually effectively nagging them, but they actually think it's cool and they go and click on the systems. Obviously there's another button. There's the yes, it was me button and there's the escalate button. And the escalate button, obviously the moment it gets clicked, we get, get an alert and there's a Jira ticket again that gets filed automatically. And then we can start essentially tracking the incident. And we can essentially have numbers for the amount of incidents that we have. And we can track the number of incidents as time goes on. The other thing that I would like to point out is that this actually drives um, communication from the security team. Scaling email is really hard. Nobody reads emails. So if there's a new security policy, you essentially send out an email saying, oh, please don't do this, pseudo sue. Pseudo sue is pretty bad. We uh, don't really like you running around with root. And 15% of people actually read the email, right? 
So with this, they are forced to actually acknowledge that they're seen um, and that they're doing something bad. And they also have a pop-up that shows them and tells them, look, this is why it's bad. And this is what you can do if you don't want to do pseudo sue. This is how you can actually go about doing your job. And if this new proposal does not really fit what you're doing, then please come talk to us and we'll find another way. And this has actually been able to drive communication from the security team to all the developers in a lot more effective way, right? Because people now understand what we're doing, they understand what our job is, and they understand that these alerts are actually, we're watching, right? These alerts are actually doing something that um, we would be alerted otherwise. So in terms of summary and to conclude the presentation, I think the really key point here is that you should find a way in your organization of distributing the load. You should distribute the load through your managers. The number of security people does not scale necessarily with the number of engineering or engineers, but the number of managers does scale with the number of engineers. And also the number of engineers scales with the number of engineers. So if you're using them to actually do um, support or using them to support your organization and support your, your policies, then you're going to have a way to scale to a large number of engineers. We built at Square several tools that allowed us to do this. I showed a few of them that are around vulnerability management, around access control, and security monitoring. And really at Square, this has really helped us, actually myself particularly, go back to sleeping nine hours uh, per night, actually around eight hours and a half. But it really has helped us have a lot more trust in the organization because we know these automatic tools are there and these automatic tools will help, help us maintain security. This is the end of my presentation. Feel free to ask any questions you might want. Um, so, I don't know if you are allowed to talk about it, but this was a good presentation on um, cutting down on the amount of alerts that your security team has to go through by uh, sending out the alerts to the person who created that problem. Um, what do you do with the system when it is the person who created the problem, they click, yes, it was me, I meant to do that, but they're doing something that's malicious? How, how do you differentiate that? Uh, that's a great question. So, there are, the answer there is the focus of the system was built to essentially protect against 90% of the attacks. 10% of the attacks are insiders. We can see statistics of that online. But 10% of attackers are insiders. 90% are the rest of the people that are going come around and do weird stuff. So this protects against 90%. Also, there was a detail that I didn't mention, which is there's a reason why attackers can't really just acknowledge the alert by themselves if they're in possession of the computer, because there's actually a key that you have to physically touch to go to the two-factor portal to actually go and click on the alert. So an attacker can't just come in and then say, yeah, this was me, this was me, everything is good, uh, business as usual. The other thing that we do, though, is we still have monitoring on the amount of tickets that we have. And the reality is that the number of suspicious alerts that we have is high enough right now. However, what we're doing with Sting, and this really drives the education part, is that we should go to a point where a self-service alert is no longer self-serviceable where a self-service alert does not happen commonly and should not happen at all, and therefore starts coming directly to us. So really Sting is a way of us just supporting the reality, which is we get way, way, way too many alerts to something that's scalable, and then bringing those alerts back to one-to-one -one matching, I should be looking at this as time goes on. And my answer is that. As time goes on, those number of alerts should go down, and then we have one-to-one -one alerts, and we can actually monitor people doing this because they won't have the option of actually self self-assigning them to themselves and acknowledging it. Thank you. Other questions? This one right there. Um, with your security monitoring, do you do uh, more than just authentication logs? Do you look at things like NetFlow or other kind of firewall logs and tie these things together? So yeah, the, the point we migrated from a system that was built that was built on MySQL and that wasn't really scaling very well. So we essentially started porting all of our logs into Hadoop. So every single log from firewall hits to authentication failed to um, pseudo to anything that I might want, even the honeypot alerts, all of that gets congregated and gets essentially um, sent to Hadoop. And then it's on us to actually build jobs that create these self-service of alerts and for us to decide, is this an alert that should go to people? Is this an alert that doesn't go to people? For example, we have cool alerts around if you ever try to touch anyone's bash history or anyone's history at all, we actually get alerted of that. And the cool thing is that now that you have a system like this, you not only alert the person that actually edited the history 
history, you alert the person whose history was edited. Like, is this cool? Like, is what this person is doing? And this really opened up just a sea of possibilities of actually having two people of your engineers looking at each other's alerts. So that's the next step for us. It's really scaling completely outside of all the alerts and having them make sure that they're protecting themselves. So these are some awesome tools. Are any of these open source? And if not, are you going to open source them? That's a million dollar question. We, as an organization, um, really drive open source. I don't know if you uh, are familiar with our GitHub page, but we have around more than 200 projects. So we always strive to open source these things. We don't really believe that there's anything that we're hiding in terms of security. So even our, we're, we're planning on open sourcing our uh, secret um, distribution management systems and all of these things that are actually part of our core security. So the answer to that is yes. We actually built Sting to be open sourceable, uh, try to not have a lot of tie-ins into our uh, internal um, APIs, into our internal systems. But it's actually really hard because you have so many of these things that are already provided by other tools, right? So we're hooking up Doorman into UserDB, and then Sting hooks up into both Doorman and UserDB, and so everything has its own interrelationship. And there are things that are core to the systems that are just provided by our internal systems. And it becomes really hard to decouple these things. And sometimes we do, and then we look at the final product and say, OK, this is actually not that valuable when you decouple it from everything else. So it is a struggle. And uh, there's an organizational push and an engineering push to make sure that we open source as much of this as possible. Hi. Do you do uh, any sort of security regression testing to ensure that those bugs don't reappear? So yeah. The, um, Pop quiz has some of that, uh, which is we when there's something like, for example, my example was uh, Poodle, right? There's something like Poodle. We know that SSLV3 is bad, and so we just edit test, and it's always there. And if there's if ever an, a regression, it actually comes up. The other thing is that scanners are always, all of our internal scanners, external scanners, are constantly monitoring everything. And every time something new comes up, they open a new ticket. So they are actually smart on correlating what ticket was closed and what ticket was open and what vulnerability matches in terms of timeline. So if later on the same vulnerability happens to uh, happen in the same system, it actually alerts us again. And then we go again on the circle and on the life cycle um, diagram, like from detection until it actually gets completed. So there's th th those are the two main things. It's setting tests for things that have appeared to make sure that they don't get it, they don't appear in the future. And when they do, we get alerted about them. No, it's just good hygiene. Other questions? Yeah, so the question is if uh, there's usually a backlog of P3s and uh, P4s um, that just queues up. There's definitely a backlog. There's always a backlog. I don't think it's been an issue so far. Uh, there are vulnerabilities that are really on the nice to have categories. And usually, those vulnerabilities usually get just engulfed on the next or two cycles ahead in terms of like security. Um, we, we have these cycles where we build these infrastructure wide uh, mechanisms to protect against class level vulnerabilities. And that's when we try to address some of the vulnerabilities P4s that are common. Um, so sometimes there's a backlog. There's still an SLA for P4s and P3s. So SLA is just bigger, right? And people still have to go to the meetings if they are not keeping it. So eventually they'll actually be fixed, right? That would be the answer to that. Question over there. Do you guys do any analysis about repeat offenders of uh, people who log tickets for the self-service? Um, and if so, do you do outreach and education for those people? A re-education. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so the question is if we log uh, repeat offenders on self-service and if we actually do targeted education to those users. Targeted education. That's, that's an interesting <laughs> way of putting it. So the answer is we log everything. Uh, we are really good at uh, ensuring that everybody in the organization doesn't really feel like they're being watched. So the answer is actually no. But we do log everything, and we just have... If, if there's a spike of uh, alerts on an individual, then we essentially go talk to them. But there's no specific bring, bring them into this room and explain them what the importance of this thing is. Uh, there are definitely teams that are worse than others and are teams that we work closer with. And the way that we work closer with these teams is actually pretty cool. Is just the realization of it's our fault. It's not their fault. 
it's our fault that we've not been working closer to them. And it's actually our fault that they don't understand that this is a class of bug or this is a class of behavior that is actually not allowed. So what we do is, since it's our fault, is actually put our time into it. And we go and we embed ourselves into the teams and we work with them. And by having a security engineer in a team like this means that you get the behaviors from the security team. So the security engineer should not be pseudo suing around. And he, he should also like propagating the knowledge in terms of bugs. So this is what this class of bug is. This is what has been happening a lot to your application. And this is how you fix it. And then that security engineer is just responsible for just being part of the team and helping them grow. And then hopefully those graphs start coming down. And then we have to take that security engineer to another team to help them out. Any more questions? I have, uh, I, I, I always have a question. Uh, we also do reviews in our engineering organization here in infrastructure, actually not in security in particular, like to review uh, what we call site events or things that happen in the site in the previous week and make sure that we are learning the exercise. And like you seem, your meeting with the VP seemed to be kind of similar. Uh, what are the things that you do and how is the dynamic of this meeting for people to not feel that is like a blame exercise? Uh, that's a good question. I think for us, the major difficulty was to make sure that we went into the meeting and there was no doubt that the security team was not responsible for fixing the bug, right? There was no doubt that the security team was responsible for this bug. That was, that was the, the first step that we had was going to this meeting and having the managers own their vulnerabilities and having the managers actually make sure that, oh, this is why it wasn't fixed. It's a very good reason for it got deprioritized for this and that, but we will get it done as soon as possible. And so that was, a, that was step number one. I think really is about the posture of the people that are in the meeting. So every time somebody's saying, oh, this wasn't fixed and we're having these issues, I immediately volunteer, what can I do to help? And so that was essentially what we tried to do in terms of meeting. It was the VP of engineering, our, our VP of engineering is actually a very reasonable person. She's actually amazing. She makes tons of jokes, but people still feel that they are in the meeting with VP of engineering. And just that little, presence just makes all the difference in the world. And then we're there, we're consultants, they know that we can help them. The worst case scenario, they help or they ask for help saying, oh, we can't fix this, please secure your team, come in and um, help us fix this uh, because we can't really meet, meet this SLA. So I would just say this is more about of uh, individual uh, posture in the meeting from the security team um, of not actually making sure that we are doing blame shifting. Any more questions? Arms raised. I guess we're done. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, guys.